All right, so the, t- the title for today's message is The Triumphant Entry. And this is Palm Sunday is, is today. Um, it's the day designated as Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem. And as the songs we sang, it was Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So that it all kind of connects. And this message is in all four Gospels. And not all, not all of the events of Jesus' life are in all four. Um, there's probably about less than a dozen that are in all four books or all four Gospels. So it's, it's one of those events that's, that's very, it's important for us to understand it and important for us to know. Uh, on the surface, you know, as we'll read here, you know, it looks like just an interesting event. Jesus rides into Tong and a donkey of all things, and people praise his name. But, you know, as we really dig in more, we're, we're going to find a lot more. And I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, this, one of the most amazing prophecies to me is involved here. It actually will predict Jesus' entry into Jerusalem to the exact day. And this was prophesied 600 years before it actually happened. So, I mean, that's, it's incredible to think about that. Um, you know, like, just for an example, like, think of us predicting something 600 years from now. I mean, we don't even know what's happening 600 years from now. Things change so fast in our lifetime, day to day. Um, so to have that 600 years, it's, it's just, it is, it's truly amazing. All right, and then we'll also see two other scriptures fulfilled. Um, we'll see the trans- how Jesus was transported, and then the crowds, um, what, they, what they cheer. That's all in um, events that are they're talked about. So through these three prophecies, we're going to see that Jesus, he's in complete control of the situation. We're going to see that only by just divine intervention that these three things can be woven together to happen. And it really just gives us evidence that the Bible is true. The Bible has um, always been true. It always will be true. It, um, it is completely reliable, as the scripture even says. So those are kind of the three, three main points. So what I want to do is, Dave, you want to hit slide two? We're going to go through Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> and what I'd like to do is I will read the odds, and then I want us all to read the evens. I like when we all read together. So, All right, verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Very good. All right, verse 3. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sent, set him on them. Verse 9, then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. All right, so we have a little background. We kind of know, know the story, so we'll dig in a little bit more here. So in, back in Matthew, verse 1 and 2, you know, we see Jesus sends his two disciples. Um, he says, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet. So here you have 
I mean, I'll just kind of lay it out pretty easy. You got two disciples that are told by Jesus, go into the town. You come in, it's the town next to you. And you're going to find a colt, and you're going to find a donkey. They're tied up. Loose them, bring them to me. If anybody stops you, here's what you say. And it happens exactly like Jesus says. You know, it's Jesus knew where they would be. They knew how many there would be. And as we'll, we'll get into Mark, Mark gives us a little bit more information about it, but we'll get to that later. Um, but this is, just, this is one of those amazing things to me. You know, to be one of the disciples in Jesus' time, to follow Jesus around for those three, three and a half years, they were seeing all sorts of miraculous things. And this is just one of them. Previous to this, they saw Lazarus raised from the dead. And now, you know, they're given kind of an, what I would think is an odd command. You know, of all things, find a donkey. Here's what you tell the people. And again, exactly like Jesus said. And in verse 4, Dave, if you want to flip it, it says, and Matthew even tells us this, um, this was done so that um, it could be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet. So here he's, he's even telling us, hey, prophecy is being fulfilled. So that's, this is really the first one. Uh, and this prophecy was um, spoken of by the prophet Zechariah, and it's in chapter 9, verse 9, <clears throat> if you want to look that up. All right. <clears throat> I'll lose my voice. All right, so in Mark, <clears throat> we're given some more information. Uh, it's, it says that the colt that you will find, no one has sat on this colt. So again, I don't know if any of you have ridden, you know, the colt of a donkey at all, if anybody, probably not. Um, and probably nobody's ridden one that has never been ridden on before. So I don't know if you guys know anything about horses or colts or anything like that, but this, right, they rear up. Um, they need to be broken. You know, most animals are not used to being ridden on and for Jesus just to say, you know, bring them here and then jump on them and go without any issues just shows that he's, he's in charge. He's the master of all. He's the master of the whole universe, the animals, even down to the one, one cult. He's, he's in charge. He's in control of this entire situation. So, you know, that, that's really the first prophecy that we are seen fulfilled. It's the, tr the how he's transported into Jerusalem. So the second, second prophecy, slide nine, it says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So this is the crowd's response, which is the second prophecy. And this is uh, this is actually the quote of a messianic psalm back in Psalm 118, verse 25. So it's predicted exactly what the crowd would say. And Hosanna, the word Hosanna comes from the Hebrew word meaning save now or save us. And this is the first, first words in Psalm 118. And what this is doing, it's, it's very significant what they're, what they're saying here, especially when waving palm branches. As Jesus walks through the gates into Jerusalem, as the crowd is doing this, they are, they are basically proclaiming that this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been, been waiting for. This is, the, this is our prince. And especially when they refer to David and uh, David's kingdom. So uh, to, to further um, go along with this, what I'd like you to do is turn to Luke 19. So before, before I read that, I do want to mention <clears throat> that the, even though the, the crowd was proclaiming this psalm, I'm not necessarily sure they knew exactly what they were saying. We do know through the scripture we read in Luke that the Pharisees knew, but the crowd didn't necessarily know exactly that. Uh, in Matthew, 
like we read before, it says this is, this is Jesus the prophet. And it didn't say this is Jesus the Messiah. That was the response. And then in, um, in John, it actually says that the disciples didn't know um, what was happening until Jesus was glorified. So whether the crowd really knew or not, we don't know. But as we're going to read through here, we know the, pro- the um, Pharisees definitely knew. So in verse 37, I'll read Luke 19, verse 37. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So clearly the Pharisees knew what was going on. They, they knew that the crowd was, was, was talking about Psalm 118, the messianic psalm, and they, just, they didn't agree with it. They didn't think that Jesus was the Messiah. And he, they're saying, you know, stop. Jesus, stop the crowd from saying this because it's not true. And Jesus says, oh, yes, it is true. <laughs> this, is, this is my anointed time. This is, the t- this is the time that Jesus decided was his time to proclaim, you know, have the crowd proclaim that he was the Messiah. And all the, all the different, the three prophecies that we're working through really just, describe that and prove that he is the Messiah. So that is the second prophecy. Uh, The third one that we're going to go through, we're going to turn to uh, Daniel. So if you want to turn to Daniel 9. And before we get to Daniel 9, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the book itself. uh, Because there's a lot of debate on the book of Daniel, whether it, it truly is written when it was written. And, you know, I think we need to establish, just for prophetic implications, of when it was established. So from a secular history, we do know that <coughs> the book of Daniel was uh, translated into Greek in 270 B.C. So it was, it was written in one language, and it was translated into Greek in 270 B.C. And that, that's, that, is, that is fact. So, you know, based on that, we know that this book was written 270 years before Christ was even born. So I just, I just want us to understand that this, isn't, this wasn't written after the fact. You know, there's a lot of prophecies in Daniel that a lot of people de- debate whether it was written, because how could all these things be written about way before it actually happened? But we know, you know, just through secular history in itself, that the book was translated, you know, almost three centuries before Jesus was born. And even, like I was looking up, <clears throat> I looked up in Wikipedia, and it, it, it talked about the book of Daniel. And it was citing all these reasons why, you know, it couldn't happen. Oops. But, like I said, it was translated, so we know that it had to be around. So, Daniel 9, we're in slide 12. We're just going to read a couple couple verses here. Get them up there. There it is. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last seven years. So we're we're given a date of when this has taken place. It's the first year of Darius, um, son of Xerxes. And we're also given a little information about Daniel. We know that he was a student of the Bible, or a student of the scriptures. And we know he was a student of prophecy. Because it says, understood from the scriptures, according to the word given to Jeremiah the prophet. So he was, he was looking at, at the prophet's words. And he understood that the 70 years of desolation was about to come to an end. And, you know, Israel was at that, at that time period. So Daniel wanted to pray. 
And that basically the next 17 verses talk about Daniel praying um, as they come out of the 70 years. And, and you, can, you can read um, on your own. I'm just going to pick out a couple key, key things. He says, O Lord, great and awesome God, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame. So he's, you know, God, you're here, we're down here. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. So he's, just, he's recognizing that the house of Israel has sinned against their God. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem. So he's asking, Lord, you know, we're, 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 we're sinful creatures. We've turned away from you. You know, he's, he's trying to, to turn back, and he's praying for the country to turn back to God. And with that, he's asking mercy um, from God. Uh, he asks, may your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem. And it's slowly as the verses go on, he just, the intensity picks up. He says, Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. And while he's praying this, in verse 21, the angel Gabriel interrupts him. And Gabriel gives Daniel this four-verse prophecy. So in verse 24, on slide 13, it says, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So Gabriel's given given him the start of this prophecy. And this is what, what we could refer to as Daniel's 70th weeks. And it's very, you know, it's very important from a prophetic standpoint. These 70 weeks are just, are just very important. And we'll, we'll get into it a little bit here. So verse 25 says, and th this is really what ties in the, um, the triumphant entry. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So he's given a, a start date and he's given an end date. So the start here is from the going forth of the command to rebuild or to restore and build Jerusalem. And then the end date is until Messiah the Prince. So until the Messiah the Prince is the triumphant entry. So we have this kind of start and a stop date. And then in between, it says, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. So we, we, what we have here is essentially a math equation. You got to start, you got to stop, and you've got seven plus 62 weeks of, of time. And when, when we say weeks, it literally means um, groups of seven. So this is saying there's seven sevens and 62 sevens is going on. It's, that's what's going to be in between that. So if we do the math, you'll see seven sevens plus 62 sevens is 69 sevens or 69 periods of sevens. Okay? And then, if again, keep keeping with the math, you have 69 periods of seven times seven periods of years is 483 years. So the whole... The years portion is for Israel and the, and the Sabbath. The land is supposed to, it can be worked for six years, and then it's supposed to rest for one. So that's, that's the seven years. That's the, the idiom of weeks is, is based on that. Okay? So we're up to 483 years in this math equation. Now the Jewish calendar is not based on 365 days like the like our calendar is today, but it's based on 360 days. So if you do continue with the math, you got 483 years times 360 days is 173,880 days. Okay, 
So again, Gabe, so Gabe, what is, what's happening? Gabriel has told Daniel that from the call to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes, there's going to be 173,880 days. Okay? We, we clear on that? All right. Next slide. Try to... That number is beaten into my head pretty good over the last week. I've said that multiple times. All right, so now let's try to figure out when that start date is. So for the start date, what I'd like to do is turn to um, Nehemiah. So the book of Nehemiah. And it's chapter 2. All right, so chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> and, it, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan. I need some water. <clears throat> and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, when wine was before him, that I, this is Nehemiah, took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in the presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow sorrow of heart. So to be in front of the king and be sorrowful is, was just a no-no. That's just something that you didn't want to do. The, it didn't happen. Typically they would be punished for that. Um, but clearly Nehemiah must have, you know, been well liked by by the king, and he he let him continue. And he says, it says, I became deadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. So a little groveling here. May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste, and at its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So. Nehemiah looks like he did a quick little prayer here. It says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. So it wasn't a long, drawn-out prayer because the king's you know, asking him questions. It was just a quick, quick prayer. And he said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen along, also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and, send, er, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel and which pertain to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to him according to the good hand of my God upon me. So here's, you have Nehemiah requesting to the king, you know, please allow, allow me to go and start building, um, build Jerusalem. And the king gives him letters and says it's okay. So that's, that's really, that's the start date of when it happened. And we know, um, we, we know a couple things just from, from history. We know that um, Arxerxes was, he took the throne or his coronation occurred in 465 B.C. So we know that's fact. We also know from the scripture it says in the 20th year, of King Xerxes. So it's you know, 465 plus 20 is 445. <laughs> I was took me a while to figure out the backwards. Anyway, so Xerxes, he got um, 445 BC. We also know we, we have evidence here. It says from the month of Nisan, which um, for our calendar, it flies in between March and April time frame. And Hebrew tradition says that if an actual like date of the month is not given, 
it will be on the 14th. So what we have here is evidence saying that he made this, he, he told Nehemiah that it was okay to start rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem on March 14th, 445 B.C. So there's our start date. So if, if we add 173,880 to March 14th, 445 B.C., that puts us to, I want to turn the slide, Dave. That puts us to April 6th, 32 A.D., which is the exact date that Jesus goes into the temple, riding on a donkey. So it was, I mean, just amazing. I get, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. Right. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, it's a, just an incredible prophecy, you know, just to the exact date. And I, I'm not sure if there's others like that. That's the, the one I know of. Um, it's just, it's an amazing one. The first time I heard it was, it was pretty incredible. All right. So with that, I, you know, we've, we've wrapped, or we've fulfilled three prophecies today. And, you know, enable for that to happen, you know, we, we see Jesus is, he's in complete control of the situation in order to make the, make that happen. Um, I don't think any one of us could do anything near that. You know, Jesus was in control of who. He's in control of when and where, how, um, and, and for all, all those, that entire day. Um, we know that it's really only by divine interaction that could really weave those three things together. Um, like I said, no, not one of us here could look, look back and say, oh, there's something and then try to fulfill, outline all those three things up. Um, so it's just, it gives us evidence that there's, you know, there's a God. There's a God who's, who's above time, and he's above space in order to see all those things get wrapped together. Um, so it's, it's pretty amazing. The other thing, like I told, talked about before, it gives us evidence that the Bible is true, that the Bible is real, and it's reliable. And in the world we're living in, that those are that's not the norm. <laughs> you know, the world teaches us that truth is relative, that your truth is your truth, your truth is your truth, your truth is your truth, mine is mine, and they can all be different. And that's what the world teaches. And the Bible does not teach that. And I don't know, that just doesn't even make sense to me, that that teaching. But that's that's what the that's the world we live in. And and it's really, you know, it happened. It's, it's happened f for a long time. You know, when Eve was being tempted by Satan, and what did Satan say to, to Eve? He said, you know, are you, sh are you sure? You know, was it really, is that what really, what God said? Is that, is that true? You know, so he made her question that right from the start. And then he went on to say, surely it's not true. So even from the beginning, Satan's been on the attack of truth. Um, we know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12. He, I mean, you know, we all know this, but he's not our friend. <laughs> he is the, the prince of this world. He is, he is not our friend. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he's also the father of lies. You know, John 8 says, it, says exactly that. He is the father of lies. So we, just, we need to rely on the Bible and these three prophecies, again, just shows how reliable it is. And, you know, even the simplest things are, are under full attack. Uh, in Genesis 1, 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the world is teaching just the opposite. You know, and we need to know, we need to have something reliable so that we can, you know, have the discussions with people. In Genesis 1.24, he says, bring forth the living creature according to its kind, according to its kind, where the world teaches evolution. It says, we all started from one thing. And the Bible says, no, you didn't. You it from each of its kind. Um, in Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image, male and female. Obviously, that's on full attack today, too. So these are, I mean, this is literally, it's the first 27 verses of the Bible, 
and we have three big things that are in attack today. So we just we just have to keep we have to keep learning, we have to keep digging, keep reading our Bibles to to know the truth, so we can have discussions with people. Um, so I just encourage you guys to keep doing that. Jeremiah one five before I formed you in the womb I knew you. We I mean we all know where that's going. Um, the other thing, lastly, that I'll talk about is Satan attacks salvation and our salvation. Satan wants us for himself. He does not want us, um, he does not want God to have us. He does not want Jesus to have us. Romans 3.10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks after God. There is none who does good, no, not one. And what does the world teach? It says that we're all inherently good. You know, and we're not. We are clearly not. You know, the world teaches, uh, if your goods outweigh your bads, you're going to go to heaven. You know, it's all about the scale. How could, how could a, a loving God do that? Well, Scripture tells us differently. So our salvation is under attack. Acts 4, there's salvation in, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which one must be saved, which is Jesus. And, I mean, there's so many religions in this world, you can't even count them. And they say completely the opposite. But we know from Scripture, you know, there's no one righteous, and the only way we can be saved is through the blood of Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and the works that he did um, at the cross, which we'll learn, you know, this, this whole week is, is the culmination of, of all that. And we'll learn more about that on, on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday. So because we know this Bible is true, we know that there is, there's one truth, because that's what it says. We know how to act. We know how to love. Um, we know what the future holds. So it, it, when we eventually get there in, in Daniel, the next two verses in Daniel, we'll talk about the coming of the Messiah and the, the, last, the last week, the, the tribulation. So we know what the future holds and who holds the future. Um, we even know how to vote based on, based on the Bible, based on the truths that we know. We know how to vote. Um, and most importantly, we know we need a Savior, and we know who that Savior is. Above all, that's what we know to be true. Hallelujah. All right. With that, I'm going to pray us out. If you want someone to grab the worship team to come up, we'll, uh, we'll finish up. So Lord, I just, I thank you. I thank you for these incredible prophecies. Um, I thank you for this time this morning that we had to, kind of, to go through them and, and do the calculation and, and see it on paper. And um, so I thank you for that. I thank you that we're able to gather in this place. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to, to be here together with brothers and sisters. So I thank you for that. I pray that the Holy Spirit it just works in us <clears throat> to help us understand just exactly what you want us to understand. Not what I said, <clears throat> but what you want us to understand. I pray that we're able to take these learnings and, and share our faith. I mean, it's just an incredible prophecy and something that we can share with others to show um, just that the Bible is true. Um, I pray that for anyone who are really questioning the validity of the Bible, that you know, through the fulfillment of these scriptures, they're, they're better able to understand exactly why we can rely on this book. Um, you know, we're able to rely on this more than any other book on earth. So with that, in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.